I'm here for a creative space with Trisha Lovell, who, like me, is a girl from Artis Antigua. That's how I refer to myself, girl from Artis Antigua. <laughs> remind myself of our beginnings and also because Artis travels with me wherever I go. And as a writer, that those places I've gone to have been very, very far from that community. And I think the same can be said for Trisha Lovell, who works in a very different sphere, but who has traveled far from the days when I remember the group of us walking to Holy Family School together from Otters. And now she's in Sweden yes. doing big things. First of all, tell us, <laughs> tell us Trisha, um, who you are and where you are. Okay, so um, my name is Trisha Lovell and I am currently in Sweden where I'm pursuing a doctorate degree at the World Maritime University. Um, but before that, I, I have been working in fisheries and the fisheries sector for many years. Like you, um, I will always have a love for um, the community that we grew up in. I don't think there's any other community like Otis. It is simply and was simply amazing growing up in that community. So yeah, Otis girl to the world. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what Otters, I mean Antigua is a small island, 108 square miles, and my experience of growing up in Otters was we went to the beach on holidays, public holidays and walkathons yeah. and that sort of thing. We were very landlocked as a community. So how yeah. does a girl from Otters end up working so much with the sea? Ah, that is an excellent question. So actually when I was growing up, I was terrified of the ocean. I was, I, I mean, I, and I think a lot of it had to do with my mom as well. My mom wasn't, you know, she wasn't a fan of the ocean. She, my mother basically waited until knee high in the water and she would sit there in the sand and sand bathe. And that's basically what our beach experience was. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I did not envision, I think when I was growing up, I wanted to be everything from a teacher to a child psychologist to everything under the sun than a marine management person in any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. But I think what got me interested in, in uh, marine science on a whole, I think a lot of it is through formal education, but also through um, organizations and groups like library summer program where they took you out on these field trips places that we wouldn't necessarily have gone to before yeah. um and of course you know miss um mrs mrs mayors was very um instrumental in that big program up mrs. And mayors. I, big up mrs mayors this is big up, big up mrs mayors. You know, mrs mayors yeah yeah so she really got us out you know so you got to see a different side of antigua and i think you know i, I don't know if they still have the library summer program at least in they this do. The they form do. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I definitely would credit that as one of the, the kind of um, programs that got me interested. And then, of course, as you get out, you go to, to secondary school and then you're exposed to teachers who are passionate about um, not necessarily marine science specifically, but um, environmental issues. And so um, Mrs. Cooper comes to mind when I was in um, Christ the King High School and, of course, she used to take us out on field trips. So you got to see it. It's, a lot of it is through formal education, but also through some of these other extracurricular activities. But there, and has then, been, there has still been something in you that was drawn to it though, because I would have been exposed to the library and to school. We went, we had the same school journey. And yet, yeah. I, you know, the, the whole sea relationship is much closer to your mothers than to you. <laughs> You're right. So actually, it's funny, I, I just knew that I did not love, what I loved about, the things I loved about school were the activities that took me outdoors, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't know, if, I guess it was just intrinsic in me. I just loved being, I knew I didn't want to be anything in an office. And I knew I didn't necessarily want to be in a lab, even though I was interested in science subjects, Uh, are responsible for management of the fishing sector. That means um, the orderly management of the fishery sector. So that means that we're looking at licensing and regulating fishing activity, but more broadly, we are responsible for um, management of the marine space. So that means 
um, not just the fish, but also the environment and the ecology. So your reef systems need to be healthy. And you know what, what is the role that fisheries plays in doing that? So monitoring and management of these species, declaring areas that might be critical habitats. Um, and yeah, and of course, col collaborating and cooperating with other agencies. So a lot of the work that we have been doing in fisheries has been through cooperation with both um, government agencies, but also non-governmental agencies as well. So a lot of collaboration with um, the Environmental Awareness Group, as you know, they've done a number of projects and programs that include some aspects of the marine environment. And so some of, you know, some of the committees for these programs and projects that they have, fisheries would sit um, and provide technical guidance to a lot of those initiatives as well. So a lot of what I would have done would have been um, kind of collaborating with some of these other external agencies that deal specifically with conservation, larger conservation issues. What do you think is most misunderstood about, um, not necessarily just the work that you do, but why it matters? What do you think about the, the marine space? What do you think is, from a community standpoint, what is most misunderstood? Okay, so I think a lot of a lot of, of the misunderstanding where it comes to the marine environment, a lot of it is kind of grounded in some of the tradition, traditional view of the world. So when I joined fisheries, you would typically hear statements, oh, fish can't done, a god see water. So, um, you know, so it's, it's like a free for all. Or it should be a free for all because it don't belong to anybody. But if it doesn't belong to anybody, then it also means that nobody's responsible for taking care of it. Mm. Obviously, we know that that's not the case. We know through international law, um, why the ocean governance principles that, yes, it belongs to somebody and somebody has a responsibility. And of course, the state of Antigua and Barbuda is ultimately responsible. That's why we sign on to conventions like the law of the sea, that which basically says, okay, yes, you can, you have um, sovereign rights over this, but you also have a responsibility to protect it. These dates are not arbitrary dates, right? They relate to something and they relate primarily to the biology of the animal. So what you're trying to protect with the close season is spawning activity. And so basically what we're saying to people, okay, you like to have lobster, you wanna be able to have lobster. Going forward, you have to allow the animals to naturally do what they're going to do. So that is actually why you have two, two, two month close seasons. In other places, it's as much as four and six. Right, and so what? What one of the discussions during those particular um, consultations was? Okay, so you have, if you're going to say we're going to close both conch and lobster for four months, mm -hmm. you have fishermen that that's all they do. So basically, you're going to be putting somebody out of bread for four months. Mm -hmm. um, and so perhaps a way around that is so okay, you close one for two months and the other for two months, and they don't overlap. Okay. Right. So that I mean, those kinds of negotiations have to happen. No, it, it does not mean that in the future, if the re resource requires it, we don't go back, we look at um, the close season. It might need to be lengthened because in other places, as I've said, in the region, it has been lengthened. And so it all, it all but it always has to come back to the biology of the animal. What is happening with the stock? Okay, so it's and, and it's balancing, balancing that with the livelihood of the people. Yes, exactly. You know, things change and there are other pressures that are acting on the resource that are outside of fisheries, climate change, tourism activities, you know, the health of your reef, your marine debris, runoff from land, all of these pressures and trying to balance that with the, what the fishermen are doing. It's, 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 a, it's a unique problem that we have within the marine environment that we don't necessarily have on the land, right? The, the complexity of managing marine space spaces, I think people need to understand. It is a significantly more complex activity than for persons who are dealing with terrestrial systems. Because? Because of just the fluidity of the, the, the area. Everything is connected, right? So you have arbitrary borders between countries, yes, but 
the water don't stop and the fish don't stop. So even if I protect my turtle in Antigua, if they go over to St. Kitts, they're going to get eat. <laughs> you understand? So, so that, know, requires, really... that means that there has to be more collaboration and, and everybody being on the same page. Like you can't just be on one page on your island or in your country and then you name Exactly, it. exactly. There is with marine systems, the need for cooperation, regional, international cooperation is ever more critical than when you're dealing with terrestrial systems. What is, what is the most difficult thing, not just in terms of closed open season, but what is the most difficult issue we're grappling with today in terms of the marine environment? Uh, I think as basically, one is the complexity of the system. Two is all the external pressures that really and truly, as managers, there is no control over. Um, so For things example, like climate change. Okay. Climate change is a big one, you know, existential threat. You know, people may be familiar with, with, with what it means, but they may not necessarily relate to it, right? Because it just well, seems so... I'm relating to it right now, but it's melting the <laughs> It seems so big. But then, you know, 2017 Hurricane Irma, if, if Hurricane Irma didn't kind of, you know, put that in, 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 into people's minds that the issue of our climate is critical. But you know, there's still I mean, people who say that these issues have been here since forever. I had a conversation with someone just yesterday who um, basically doesn't seem to think that hurricanes in the region are a big deal and we can never get a tsunami and all these kinds of things. And I'm like, I mean, wild weather events are wild. I mean, the world, the, these are one of the consequences yeah. of climate change. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the thing is, the other two, the other problem is they equate weather with climate, which is not the case weather is not that, climate that. <laughs> we're right? snowing outside and we can still be having global warming yeah exactly 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 so that's the first the first message it's not the same yeah. right when you're thinking about climate issues obviously it's going to be long term you know long 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 term um variations and you know trends and so on whereas you know weather can change tomorrow But I know one of the things I, I think I understand about climate change is that um, uh, in terms of certainly in terms of hurricanes, wilder weather events, more erratic um, events, more, more frequency of certain types of, of weather events that used to happen once every how many years or whatever. And when it comes to hurricanes, the way it's connected to what you do has a lot to do with things like reef management and of course, yes, yes, and yes. Sort of thing. So yeah. In a sense, like you were saying, it's, it's all connected. What we're seeing in terms of hurricane, hurricane Irma is connected to what you do. It's not just about what, what is our fish population. Is that a fair assessment? Exactly, exactly. Because it's all, as you say, when, when, when a hurricane comes through, it does a significant amount of damage. Yes, it damages us as people, um, our homes and our buildings and so on, the infrastructure that we have to deal with, but it also that damages these natural systems. And as the storms get ever more frequent and um, stronger, what happens is, okay, so you have a storm, if you say you have a storm tomorrow and a reef is completely destroyed and you have another one two, two years down the line, that reef is never really given the opportunity to, um, to basically recover. Right, and that is the problem. As the storms get more frequent, um, the reefs are going to be severely impacted because reefs take a very long time to grow. It's a slow-growing process, right? Really? So if you're talking about Go if ahead. you're talking about your reefs being destroyed, then you also have to connect that to um, okay. So tourism is very dependent on reefs. We don't think about it, but it is. You know, you like you like nice white sandy beaches. You need reefs for that. Okay, but you have businesses that build their whole brand around um, ecotourism within the marine environment. Um, you have kayaking tours and snorkeling tours and diving tours and all of these things are part of ecotourism, right? Um, but the, the problem is a lot of times, I don't know if 
the, the thinking is you have to be big or go big to have a big economic impact, but it doesn't have to be, right? And I think a lot of times with the development projects that we are seeing as a country or a government or particular agencies within the government, we have to be able to say there is another way. Your model is not necessarily the best one, right? So you don't need to build a five-rise hotel um, 10 feet from the beach, right? You can do eco lodges, charge twice as much or three times as much, and you have the same economic return. The, the training programs usually are the ones that give the opportunity for, for more outdoor activity and explorations. Because a lot of the times the training programs that I'm involved with, they're very hands-on. Mm -hmm. So yes, I did do a fellowship in Australia a few years ago where it was looking at reef management and how we as leaders um, contribute to the, the, the management of reef systems and what makes a good reef manager and so on. And so a lot of that was going outside in the field and you can't talk about reef management in Australia and not go to Great Barrier Reef, so yes. Um, so yes, I did get an opportunity to do that. Um, I've been to Cancun, Mexico, where we've had, you know, field trips um, through, we did a, a, I think it was a, a program on uh, like forensics almost for, for wildlife crimes, but specifically looking at things like sea turtles and so, um yeah so and and a part of that a lot of that is simulation exercises doing a stakeout in the beach and having a robber come and you're so in like the dark yeah yeah yeah, okay. yeah. So, i mean i mean it's been it's been I, I think i've had a blessed life but a lot of it has been you know me actively seeing the opportunities right i think a lot of times people get into a job and they sit back in their their tent with you know going to the office every day Mm -hmm. but you always have to look for opportunities to keep learning. Okay, so um, basically, okay, so the whole idea of derelict fishing gear, so the, the program that we are, we are on is one that is looking at marine debris generally. So derelict fishing gear is just a particular type of marine debris okay. that originates from fishing activities. So it could be anything from discarded pots to lines to nets, ghost nets, um, looking at basically what, what I'm focusing on, on is derelict fishing gear in the context of small scale fisheries. The thing about it is derelict fishing gear, um, although everybody knows, you know, kind of about it, it hasn't been really something that's been extensively studied as opposed to other forms of marine debris. So there's, you know, a significant, body of work that focuses on marine plastics, for instance. There's, you know, all these research cruises that specifically look at things like microplastic and marine plastic and so on. But in terms of the derelict gear, um, there hasn't there has been some focus, but it has not been as extensively studied. And so that's why I, you know, obviously the the linkage to fisheries, um, because I am I'm, I am a fisheries manager, but um, recognizing that fisheries the impact that derelict gear can have on um, the marine environment and wildlife and even the, the economics of socioeconomics of persons. Because if you're talking about you're having, you know, huge nets floating in your waters, that's maybe ghost fishing or taking away resources that would otherwise be um, available to fishermen. You know, how is that inf impacting the livelihoods of um, our our fishers as small scale fishers, right? So, 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 at this point, the research is more about trying to figure out what's happening, or do, are you trying to prove a hypothesis? No. So yes, basically, it's it's more of a socioeconomic research. So I'm not, it's not. There's no um, I'm trying to prove any hypothesis. So it's really trying to understand what is the state of play as it relates to to the issue of derelict fishing gear within our region. Um, and looking at specific fisheries where there's not necessarily a lot of information on. So for instance, quite a bit of work has been done on traps, but there is not a lot of work that's been done on fish aggregating devices, for instance, and how that contributes to the issue of derelict gear in the region. Um, yeah, so it's, it's looking at where the research gaps lie and trying to really 
basically expand the knowledge as it relates to our particular area. So um, given that it's primarily fact-finding at this point, you can't speak to the potential impact in terms of legislation and that sort of thing? Um, not at this moment, but what I've been doing, what I have been doing so far is really looking at what legislation and policies currently exist, where the gaps in our legislation may lie. So for instance, looking at the fisheries laws within specifically the OECS, um, do they need to be strengthened? I think the case can be made that they definitely do need to be strengthened. Um, a lot of the legislation that we have within the OECS region, it's very dated. Um, it doesn't cover necessarily um, a lot of the, the, the impacts that would result from derelict gear. So for instance, things like, um, does your legislation include provisions that would allow for or necessitate fishermen reporting if gear is lost. A lot of times, based on the research that I've been doing, that is not a necessity, right? It's not, there's no obligation, right? So currently I've been looking at the, the existing policy and legislation where the gaps lie mm -hmm. um, and seeing how those can be strengthened. But I will be also looking at other aspects as well. I think obviously, I think for any government, and it's not just not just Antigua and Barbuda, it's any government in the region, the need to balance the economic stability of your country versus some of these other issues of livelihoods and communities and fishery sustainability and environmental management. It's a tricky one, right? And really trying to it's find a tricky that one. Balance. It's a tricky one, Trisha, but keeping it real, sometimes it's not so much about balance, it's about greed. I mean, we can have balance, right? But then sometimes mm -hmm. we're, we're stepping into, I want to profit to a degree that offsets what the environment needs to be self-sustaining. So yeah. that is the frustration. It is a frustration, but then I always say it. You're inside of it. Is that a frustration? Let me put it that way. Is that a frustration? That's yes. That we can go so far, but do we need to take this next step? Yeah, it, it is a frustration, not just for you as outsiders, but also for, for us as we work in the industry. But what I would say is a lot of times um, it's not just the policymakers the issue, right? Um, I, I remember when I joined fisheries, I don't know if you, you remember this, this was 1999 when they had that issue in Old Road. Yeah, 1999? Um, or 90 something, or two, was it early 2000? I don't remember. Oh, wow, time flies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or they had that issue in Old Road where a resort was basically going to be essentially decimating a, a wetland, right? And people spoke up. And this is the, the, the other thing that I, I like to impress on people. There are, I mean, a lot of times the politicians may not necessarily listen to us as technicians, but they do listen to the voters, right? And people, our communities need to stand up for what it is that they want, yeah. right? So that's going to be critical going forward. And the other thing is you also have to have developers with an open mind. So another example that I will give is- Before you go on to the other example, I'd just like to put a, a footnote here for. Um, listeners to check out the song Old Road Fight by Queen Ivina, which chronicles that thing that you were just talking about. Yes, 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 yes. Right. So an another example, you have to have developers that are willing to go into a development project with an open mind. So I don't know how familiar you are with um, the South Coast Horizons tour that they offer currently. I'm not um, sure. I've so done, if I've a done South Coast Horizons, that's, that's the one out in the Cades Bay area. Yes, yes. I've done, I've done, like, the, they have a canoeing, snorkeling thing. Right, right. Yeah, so, but that's not the model that they started with. Okay. So it's not the model that they started with. I didn't know So that. when we, yeah, so when we were called, we were actually called as a division to that project. Um, and this was like in the very early stages and there was just a bulldozing of the marine, the mangrove from the sea all the way in. Wow. Yeah. And the plan was something a lot more intrusive, right? And it was basically fisheries and environment and other agencies sitting with the de developer and saying, look, 
you have prime real estate here. Okay, you have the opportunity to produce a product that nobody else on Antigua can, can provide, right? And he was able to basically have a, keep an open mind about how his model could be changed um, so that it has more of an, an ecologically sensitive approach, right? So that's the other thing. Which is beautiful, but I wonder if before developers begin to develop anything, if from the point of view of them getting permission to develop, that this can be part of the discourse, that an agency doesn't have to step in after the fact, but they understand. Yes, it should, it should. That's, that would be the ideal. Yeah, so you have to, but you have to, so basically what we do is we look at the small wins. And that's wow. all you can do, right? Look at the small wins, otherwise you're gonna go crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. That's the that's the kind of mindset you have to have. It's just one thing at a time, and 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 look at these little victories that can then have a yeah. sort of multiplier. I mean, and the thing about it is, yes, there's been a lot. Unfortunately, we've lost a lot um, in terms of the marine and coastal environment. But we also have had done a lot through environmental awareness group and the partnerships with that group and um, others. Amazing things. Um, with regards to bringing species back from the brink of extinction, rehabilitating islands that would have basically been dead, you know, so we also have to, you know, a lot of it has been not so glowing, but we also have to, you know, you know, basically congratulate ourselves. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, I think what is critical is for us to recognize as individuals that the smallest acts that you do as an individual impact wider systems. So I, when I do school tours with, with students, um, I say your simple act of deciding whether or not to throw the bottle out of the car window versus taking it to a bin. I mean, it might seem like a small thing, but cumulatively it, it, is, um, it can be significant, right? The other thing and that when, I want people and, to and, and could I add, when you take it to the bin, making the choice to put it in the recycle. Recycling versus, yeah. exactly, exactly, exactly. Small, we can, we, we all have an individual role to play and our, our role may seem small, but it is impactful and you need to recognize that, right? Um, that that's, for me is critical. The other thing is, um, I tell people all the time, you know, it's, 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 if you're going to be, if, if you want to, really learn about you have to be able to connect with nature and in order to do that you need to experience nature right you need so to go outside. you need to go outside <laughs> you know you need to go to the beach you need to take a swim you need to see what's underneath the water you know even if you're just putting your head in you don't have to go snorkeling or diving Right. <laughs> you know why I said that just now? Because I have my, my latest book, I have a children's picture book called The Jungle Outside, which is about this very thing. It's about the kid looking up from the device and stepping out the door and exploring. Yes, 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 yes. You know, you will sit down in your room and watch your little phone and you'll be watching nature and National Geographic. We have National Geographic outside your window, you know. You could just yep. you open the door and go and experience it. And, and the beautiful it. thing, Trisha, about growing up in Addis Antigua, as I remember it, is how little time we spent inside. Yes, it's true. We're you always outside. Trees, always. You go away, <laughs> come back at the end of the day. <laughs> exactly. So you have to, you have to. And I think if people connect with nature that way, then they would, hopefully, my view is they will take ownership of, of it. Yeah. and you know really try to be positive in the way they deal with nature but it can't nature can't be seen as this seen as this you know existential thing you know we have to be a part of it 